Hi there, welcome to Camera Peeps. Uh, in this episode, we have invited a colleague of ours, Andre, onto the show. David, yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Um, now, Andre, we are going to wind back the clock a bit in terms of camera technology um, and talk about some really old cameras. And you just happen to be the custodian and owner of this particular camera we've got up on the screen now. Yes, I've had that camera for many years, since I was 17 years old, in fact. Really? Okay, yeah. <laughs> get on to that. So what <laughs> is this camera? Can you please, I know what it is, but can you just okay. please explain? It's a Marconi Mark IV. They were brought into Australia around about 1960. Uh, the predecessor was a Mark III, and that, saw, that pioneered the start of Australian television. Yep. And uh, the, the Mark IV is an improved version and uh, it works a little bit better in low light, uh, it's a bit more compact and uh, just like everything it just has a few improved features. Fair enough. D this particular camera has a bit of history to it in this country? It does, yeah. Uh, this particular one came from Melbourne and it was in the Teletheatre which was uh, run by Channel 7 originally okay. and uh, it covered a lot of live variety shows in the life at the Teletheatre. Um, in some TV shows it was even featured uh, on an episode of Homicide as part of one of their crime stories. Amazing. Uh, we'll just go to another picture. There's another shot of it. Um, of course something that uh, stands out here of course is this is uh, pre-zoom lenses. So are you able to just run us through? Yeah, back in the day when this camera came out, zoom lenses weren't really perfected. They were still trying to get that right. So in order to get the different focal distances, they had four lenses. So you had four options, close, near, far, and in between. So as the zoom lens was developed, they eventually found that they could make one that would fit on the bottom turret of the camera. So that meant that the other three lens turrets or mountings were blocked off. So that meant that you had a mechanical zoom option if you needed it. But that came out sort of later and they were very expensive because it was new technology at the time. So with, uh, so from the camera operator's point of view, uh, I'll just go to the next shot, or oh, there's another shot of the lenses. Uh, this particular side shot here, um, so you would change the... Yeah, the handle that's seen on the side, that would actually turn the turret around. There's two? So, the, okay, so it's the, the one up the top, Yep, right? the top handle, okay. and the rotary knob down below was for the zoom, oh, sorry, for the focus. Yep. So that actually physically brought the orthocon tube, which picks up the picture, backwards and forwards to get it into focus with the lens. So the top handle, you would turn that around, and that would give you different focal distances. Now back in the control room, the director had to be very clear as to which camera was online, because there'd be at least three in most cases, and you'd have to make sure that the camera online was not adjusted. The others could freely adjust the focal range to set up the next shot. Yeah, you, um, so, you had to be on top of your game. Absolutely, yeah. So on the odd occasion in some of those live shows you could see where the communication might have got a bit mixed up and you'd occasionally see like a porthole as the turret went around to the next lens wow so that was a big no-no okay fair <laughs> enough um and there's a shot of you um operating that camera so that just puts um gives a bit of scale it's actually yeah. it's a bit of a beast and they were they were very big heavy things and if you were sitting like we are in a set and that came towards you very quickly to get a tracking shot it was quite a it was a bit sort of, you know, distressing to see something so big coming towards you. Yeah. But that was the ultimate technology. Now, the weight in that, it took just the bottom part of that pedestal, took at least three people to lift it up. It would be about nearly half a tonne in weight. It was massive. Wow. So that was the studio pedestal, but there was also an outside broadcast portable tripod arrangement as well. Now, speaking of pedestals, I uh, can't help but bring this up. Um, we actually have, well, people who are eagle-eyed will notice that's a pretty old pedestal. I actually have one here because I also uh, try and collect uh, a bit of the old gear as well. I'm using it to um, hold up the plasma yep. TV there. But you have a couple of those pedestals? I've got believe. three of them. Yeah, right, okay. I actually have three different generations of these cameras. Okay. And, uh, yeah, to, to make it look authentic, you need the pedestal to go with it. But there's another weird thing about those pedestals. Um, they're actually made in Brisbane. 
Yeah. This one here, it's so neat. I should actually check some engineering company in, in Brisbane. Yeah. I've Googled it. I don't think it exists anymore, but they'll possibly what made I, under license or something. Yeah, I think that one's an ITE one, which is... Yeah, okay. I oh, know this one is definitely that, made in so Brisbane, some yeah, engineering. Yeah, and one of the ones I have definitely is made in Brisbane. Okay. So I don't know why they're made up there, but um, they, they made them very well. Fair enough. Um, and I was just going to ask you a bit about the Marconi company, because obviously uh, it's a name we don't hear very often anymore. I guess they're, they're no longer in business. Um, Italian name, but they're actually... Yeah, they're in England. Yes. They're an English company. Yeah. And they uh, were sort of uh, in competition with Pi, which was another major company that made cameras. And you also had the European ones, the Philips. So they sort of, all three of those companies were competing to make cameras. Yeah, great. So another big question, um, does this 60 year old camera still work? It can. Okay. If you're very patient, it will work. Now that that is amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, like not like today, where you just plug cameras in, and off they go. That required at least four hours to heat up, stabilise, because the electronics it's all valve driven. Yep. Um, the tolerances would change due to heat and warming up. So mm -hmm. that's what would happen in the days when that was set up in the studios yep. is there'd be a, an early morning crew would come in at about four o'clock in the morning and mm -hmm. turn those cameras on so they were fully functioning by 8 a.m., for yep. example, say on a weekend, and uh, they were able to do the fine adjustments. There was a lot of fine adjustments that were required that we wouldn't even think of today, and that was just to get a black and white picture. Amazing. Mm. So, Andre, uh these aren't just for us to look at, these cameras actually still get used in a way? They do, yeah. I've got a few bits and pieces. Vidfilm, the company that I run, yes. sends these cameras out on location. Yes. Um, they've appeared in a lot of retro television shows in the last few years on the various television networks in Australia um, to keep things authentic. A lot of studio shots, you'll often see them pop up and even on location for outside broadcasting. So they they still have a bit of a life in them yet. I can imagine. I, <laughs> I guess when the uh, the TV stations turfed them out, they had no idea, really, because these things are actually uh, like you can't. They're actually priceless. Not in that they're worth a lot of money. They're actually priceless because because you just can't buy these. Well, things. back in the day, the technology was just made redundant. It was mm. mainly because of the yep. black and white issue. Yep. But these days, they're black and white. They're very hard to move. Mm. They're not widescreen, they're not high definition, so it, it just means simply they're just useless and they take up a lot of space. So, But retro is in. Retro fairness. is in, absolutely, and uh, you might be surprised where you might see them turn up next. Fair enough. All right, so we'll just go on to the next one. So here's uh, another model, Marconi. This is another yep. camera out of your collection. That's correct, yes. Um, and we have a bit of a Where's Wally situation. No one's actually uh, ever commented on the videos we've been doing. There's actually two of these cameras under the desk here. I have two of these and I right, actually so store we're them actually under here. Being held together by Mark 8 cameras. That's right. So <laughs> anyhow, so this is a, this is another one from your collection. So yes. can you just uh, run us through? Yeah, well, this is a Mark 8. Mm -hmm. This was the first of the generation in colour that we got here for some of the networks. Um, it It is much, it is made by the same company. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically the same sorts of, it's got different types of tubes in it. What sort of uh, era or what sort of? Oh, we're looking era. early 70s, but by the time Australia really went to colour, it was probably the mid 70s, around 1975, yeah. when they were doing a lot of test broadcasts. They did get them a couple of years mm -hmm. earlier, but uh, they started to get regular use around about 1975, and that's, that's where they really started to take place and they were used right up until 2000. Wow, okay. So um, which networks in Australia would have been using these? Uh, the Seven Network had some. Yeah. Uh, a couple of the other networks actually used them as well. And some of the regionals. And, yeah, some of the regionals. Because yeah. I notice when them. I see those, you know, when people post those photos, the old studio photos, yeah. Nine had the Bosch fancy cameras. Uh, yeah. There was, yeah, there was Bosch, yeah. there was Philips. Yeah. And uh, there was even Sony in some places, yeah. and uh, Marconi. There was quite a lot of Marconi Mark 8 cameras, especially in the 7 network for outside broadcasting. There was quite a lot of them, and okay. they, they proved to be a very successful yeah, okay. camera. Okay. Uh, I uh, spoke to a studio camera guy who used to operate these cameras, and uh, he's not a big fan, or he wasn't a big fan of using these cameras. For whatever reason, he didn't qualify, but... They are pretty big and bulky and, and an unusual design too, the way the lens is 
Yeah, like integrated it's into unlike it. the previous camera, you have got one lens and they, yeah. they had various zoom lenses that were used, yeah. um, like for football games and things, you needed a really good yeah. heavy duty lens that yes. could zoom in a long way. Um, that seemed to be very successful with that, as is were the other cameras. Yeah. But um, this one in particular just seemed to suit those applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, and what have we got here? Um, I just noticed you've got a very authentic or recreated a very authentic setup here um, with the notes, with the notepad on the side of the camera here. Well, basically what would happen there is the cameraman would have a rundown of what the show was mm -hmm. and he would flip through no laptops, just literally by page by page flip through the programs. So it would usually be timed out with suggested camera moves or how the show was running. And sometimes that order might go completely out and that'll just be purely through the headset from the director saying, right, well, we're now going to go to this bit. So it was just a sort of a thing to glance across to and just sort of have a look and say, well, you know, this is where we are and keep on track with things. And another thing I might just point out with the power supply and the CCU for this camera is probably bigger than this, takes up more space than this camera it itself. It is. Uh, it, it's a fair amount. Of, it's a full rack mount yeah. size piece of equipment. It would be, uh, you know, like probably about, uh, if you're talking in inches, probably about uh, 12 to 15 inches yep. in height in the standard yep. rack mount, 19 inch rack mount system. So we can't just plug a four pin uh, 12 no. volt in and an SDI Unfortunately, out. you no. can't. No, it was a multi core cable. Uh, that was another thing with some of these cameras. They had track cables yep. or multi core. This was a multi-core one, mm -hmm. and basically it just went back to the CCU, and that, that basically what the difference is with that is, it, in, it's, with the TRIAC, it's just a code mm -hmm. that sends information backwards and forwards. The multi-core, each piece, each pin right. in the plug, which would have many, many pins, would uh, actually command different functions. Okay. So it's just a different way of doing it, but the TRIAC cables were more successful. What sort of tubes and what size tubes did these? Uh, Plumacon tubes, okay. which are inside. Um, the actual size, I don't have okay. the dimensions with me, but okay. uh, the Plumacon tubes, uh, like a lot of these cameras, they were very light sensitive, so I had to be very careful where you were shooting not to burn the tubes. Mm -hmm. um, that was often a and common the problem. And the technical director. Well, the technical earned, director was... Def they definitely earned their money when, yeah, in this well, era. When you were setting up a an actual production, you, the technical director or lighting person should have normally got together to make sure there wasn't any chance of lights going down the barrel of the camera to prevent this problem. So what would happen is the TD would sit in operating the CCU for the camera and make sure that the light levels were correct to prevent as much as possible. But you used to get a lot of problems, so you might get, say, a chrome microphone stand reflecting the 2K light straight into that, which would cause cobalt tailing and burning, and that, that was just a, a problem with mm those tube cameras. I know some of the, uh, I've seen on TV some of the contemporary um, you know, young bands, I've seen them actually go out of their way to source tube cameras to do their clips so it actually yeah. looks like the 1970s just to have the, the comet tailing etc. Yeah, no, it was a major problem, the comet tailing, and yeah. usually low light it was even worse because the iris was open more, so therefore it was more vulnerable to flares and comet tailing off highlighted subjects. Okay, um, the new generation of uh, cinematographers and camera people don't know how good they've got it. No, really. well <laughs> um, another big problem uh, talking of uh, uh, those sorts of cameras if you had like a, a press conference where you had people with camera flashes mm. coming up and uh, the I camera remember. flashes would just burn out the, the tubes, you, you just couldn't do anything about mm. it. These days you don't have to worry about it. Uh, well I remember the, the camera that's um, behind you, I used to use mm. that camera and I remember as a standard practice every time we moved the camera yeah. we actually kept the lens off. Uh, You'd do your best or if you did have a burn there was the option of opening up the iris and trying to burn the burn mm -hmm. out with like white paper yeah. but um, that meant the contrast eventually went in the, mm -hmm. the tubes and you know mm. that was the end of it. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Um, there's, a, there's another angle of it, um, you've got a, done a fantastic um, job uh, sourcing all these parts because you know just the lens shade, the the, the camera number, etc. it's fantastic. Because all these parts would be very difficult. We just can't get, get them. Yeah. They just simply do not make yeah, them. Right. So it's really whatever turns up. I mean, you find parts in the most obscure places. Mm. You know, mm. like it's usually people like myself that collect mm. things, they might have a part of something. Mm -hmm. And that, that would be the very bit you'd, you'd want. Yeah. I mean, if something might turn up on the second hand market, but it's very unlikely. Yeah. 
So, so, so this camera has been, has this appeared uh, in the background of a... It has appeared in a few different programs. Yeah, right, yeah. Oh, 1970s, networks. obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, for the era, yeah, yeah sort okay. of between the 70s and 80s yeah, mainly, right. and maybe into the 90s. Yeah, because right. they were used for a, mm -hmm. a good 20 years as a, a good workhorse sort of studio camera. Mm -hmm. Great. So, all right, uh, and here, here's another one from your collection. This is just one of the lenses. So uh, that is a very big zoom lens. That would be the sort of thing that you would put in the MCG or a football ground. OB, and basically. Outside broadcast, yeah, yeah you yeah. would never use that in a studio. So yeah. if you're up in a grandstand mm -hmm. looking down with 20,000 people mm -hmm. below you at a football yeah. match, for example, you could zoom right into the ball. And I guess yeah. changing the lens was a two-person operation. Absolutely, well. but you generally you wouldn't change the lens. You'd sort mm -hmm. of make the decision at the start That's of the right. game because there'd be other cameras. That, that would be the close-up follow camera yeah, okay. on, with that lens. Okay. All right, there's another shot of you, um, some publicity shots, because we uh, took these photos. Um, we haven't gone to the trouble of photoshopping them <laughs> like we were meant to. But uh, this is actually a side Roar business. is good. That's right. There's, <laughs> it's actually a side business of yours as well, so we just yeah. wanted to set... Um, well, as you can see, I'm perfectly dressed. That's how they would have been dressed absolutely. back in the day. But <laughs> and we'll have the, uh, we'll have the web address up for your, your business. Uh, I couldn't help that one. That's uh, Unfortunately, couldn't do a selfie on that one because the distance and the but, bulk. But, um, yeah, I guess when you just look at that photo and you just think, you know, how did they move these things yeah. around on the... The skill for the cameraman was quite amazing. I mean, it wasn't, you know, as you say today, they got it that easy. Mm. It was quite an effort to mm -hmm. push these, even though they glided quite well, it was yes. quite an effort to steer and stop them from running Stopping away from Stopping the one it. would have been the, the thing. Yeah, and that's that like when the talent was sitting there. You had to be yeah. very careful because you could easily lose control and knock someone out with it. So. Cause some damage. Yeah. All right, um, there's, a, there's another sh shot i think we're back to the start so look i think um we'll leave it there andre okay. and um thank you so much for coming that's okay pleasure being on the show no worries and and i hope people um enjoy this presentation because it is a pretty amazing era of technology yeah. that um we just need a reminder of how good we've got it and how, how um yeah. tough things actually were in the old days i think we may be getting you on uh for a few more chats in the future thank you again right. and uh, we'll see you next time all right Cheers. thanks